we're live, guys, right? Um, all right. Pleasure to meet everyone who's who's online with us today. Uh, my name is Anton. I'm a partner at Flashpoint, um, a European alternative tech asset manager. And uh, today um, we have a, um, a sales launch um, uh, episode, which is going to be talking about uh, the marketing's importance in the VC space. Um, and we have a few guests um, who are who are joining us as we speak. Um, we have um, Yana um, from from Yay Sort of Marketing. Uh, we have also Angela from Look AI Ventures, um, and we also have um, <clears throat> Zane um, as well um, from X Startup Wise. Um, so I will give like a few minutes for for our guests to to introduce themselves, and uh, and then we'll. Uh, kick off um, our discussion. Um, it's going to be like a lot about like um, the the roles of um, the marketing in um, across you know investments across you know positioning for um, how to you know get leads from um, uh, in terms of uh, pipeline sourcing in terms of you know how portfolio work is is going. So it's going to be like a pretty rounded discussion. But um, but let me give uh, the word um, back to our um, speakers. Um, so Yana, please introduce yourself to to the audience and uh, start with you. Thank you, Anton. Uh, thanks for inviting to uh, SaaS Lounge. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to all of you who are listening in, tuning in online, um, and share the floor with Zane and Angela. My name is Jana. I'm the managing director of Ye Starter Marketing, a B2B uh, marketing agency focused on uh, technology sector. Uh, we work with uh, clients in fintech, educational technology, sustainability tech, um, AI, and a number of uh, other areas um, here in London, UK, as well as throughout Europe, helping them to make the best um, efforts online and um, basically ensure that they, the content marketing, their um, advertising, everything is working towards the same goal, which is usually a lead generation activity for, for our clients. Thanks, Kiana. Um, Zane, shall, shall you present? Yeah, lighting please? first. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's Zane. <laughs> so, uh, but everybody in English speaking world uh, calls me Zane, and then they are surprised that I'm a girl, not a guy, because it's a male name. But here I am uh, calling in from sunny Spain, although I'm Latvian. And uh, it's funny because I was thinking what kind of title to put under my name, because as of this year, actually, I'm officially an unemployed person. I have just finished my more than seven years journey. I started Wise Guys Accelerator Fund, and my last position there was head of brand. Uh, so I was on both sides looking at uh, how the startups are uh, entering Accelerator and getting investment. Uh, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, Startup Wise Guys is one of the most active early stage investors in Europe with a portfolio of more than 450 startups. Uh, but on the other hand, I was also the one who was holding all of the marketing and brand things in my, in my hands, and I'm a true lover of storytelling and branding. So I hope to share some things about that today very excited about that discussion thank you Zane. um angel the last but not least uh please <laughs> introduce amazing thanks anton so my name is Angelo Burgarello. I'm originally from Italy, but I live in Czech Republic, and I uh, cover the role of partners at Luca Ventures together with the other two of my uh, colleagues. Uh, Luca Ventures is practically um, an exclusively focused AI focus VC based in uh, in Czech Republic with the scope of investing in uh, roughly 40 startups in within the next two three years. Uh, so we have a uh, uh, the goal to support the AI landscape in Europe first, because our scouting capabilities are, uh, you know, fine-tuned to uh, get in touch with deals in uh, Europe mainly, and we invest a ticket of 250,000 average at the beginning, uh, and then we also support our startups in the, in the portfolio further with the tickets, follow-up tickets up to one million. So. In a nutshell, that's uh, that's about us. What I do is taking care of the investors' relationship, uh, business development activities. So also scouting is part of my capabilities. I'm also uh, I have, I have an, an entrepreneurial background. I was uh, 
running a marketing agency with a media uh, outlet attached to it that I still uh, am partner with. Um, so marketing is something that's been always close to my uh, to my world. Um, so nonetheless, in the VC space, it's something that I also uh, take care of. Great. Thanks, Angelo. Um, so as you heard, you know, we, we have a variety of uh, representatives across accelerator, seed funds, you know, early stage funds, and um, and um, also uh, consulting firms helping helping uh, clients of the industry to uh, um, to um, to promote themselves in, in this marketplace. So let's start with, you know, um, uh, the first uh, that probably drives um the the spaces that the market has cooled off um in terms of you know the availability of funding maybe except for the ai niche uh but uh but anything else has, has cooled off and so uh both deal wise you know but also capital wise uh but the number of firms is still you know quite um quite the same it's not that there's anybody went out of business uh in that short period of time so how do you uh, think about uh, differentiating in the marketplace, you know, whether that's, you know, an accelerator or um, or an early stage VC? Um, so it would get interesting to get your perspective. You know, what is that that is that I, unique value proposition that, um, you know, each each one of the, the firms basically um, gives to the market that um, is able to successfully like penetrate and get clients, which is like portfolio companies for the most part. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe let's let's go into like reverse order. So, so Angelo, happy to have you started. So, first of all, it's all about unique value proposition, right? Because no matter if you're talking about uh, startups or a VC or whatever other company, you should always be able to identify what is your uniqueness, and that is what is going to differentiate you between the others. But specifically for the investment space, the only thing that really play a crucial role is specialization. Uh, because among uh, a plethora of uh, uh, generalists, um, being specialized is definitely an advantage because you get to know speci a specific industry or a specific sector. Uh, you have a specific niche network that you can tap into and you can leverage. And you also can build around that a specific community. And uh, we all know that community-based community business, it's uh, uh, something that is very powerful and can fuel a lot. So, short version will be that. Sure, Zanya. What, what about like accelerator work? You know. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, damn. I wanted to say something different, but I will have to agree with Angelo because I was just uh, just thinking about also about how the landscape has changed, and I think that uh, not only the last maybe two years with the cooling down, but even historically, started was because it's twelve years old, uh, and uh, if you look at the past, it was just enough to have. To be an investor that has money because you were like the easy early money that you could get an accelerator specifically because usually they were the next ones after friends family and fools that invested in early stage startups right so vcs came a bit later because the ticket size is a bit different and the risk uh, uh, risk level as well uh, but i think we are long not in that uh, market anymore so if there was a time when investors were lucky because startups were chasing them then i think now the the tables have turned and at least for the good startups i think investors really need to compete and this is the part where i do agree angelo a lot with you and also what we see in the last years that, that we call it a bit differently we call it verticalization but it kind of means the same thing and for example in case of startup wise guys uh, we used to run just B2B SaaS focused programs and investments accordingly for many, many years. And actually already in 2000, I think 19, we started to work verticalize. And right now there's, I think, seven verticals under, under, so with different funds and also different programs because we see that there is also so much advice right now with AI, anybody can learn anything. You can't actually kind of provide something super unique. In our case, I would say definitely the network is another differentiation. And in I would network, I would say two things. Uh, one is uh, the access uh, to market or access to experts, access to other contacts, which is something that you can get in a lot of startups would join accelerator because they want access to a particular market for example geographically uh, but the other one obviously and again i will repeat this community uh, in our case uh, we stay very very friendly <laughs> with our startups so we have uh, more than 850 founders in our community uh, just to give you an idea and uh, and we definitely see extreme power for example some of the best startups uh, come into our program through referrals uh, so we don't even need to 
differentiate that much in the marketing, just do our job really, really well uh, so that the referrals and word of mouth works. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, yeah, and curious on how do you guys, because you uh, looking, you know, at your expertise, it's like ad tech and, you know, fintech focused. So like, is that, you know, like what allows you guys to, you know, help the clients is like this verticalization um, or like there is there is more to it? Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think uh, the, the two key points that Angela and Zane mentioned are verticalization uh, or um, as Angela was saying, specialization. And I would add to that added value services. So um, it's not just in, in our domain as the um, a services a company um, in specific field service in tech, although we do that as well, for example, in order to add value to startups we work with, we host events where we bring together startups and investors so that, you know, the two parts of the equation could benefit from each other. But even if we're strictly speaking about the, the VC community, the, the investor community, um, I'm coming fresh from the event on Friday um, where basically a VC, one of the London VCs, hosted a one-day accelerator for uh, companies that they have selected. We are fortunate enough to have an offshoot um, of Yeastarter, which is uh, actually an AI-based tool um that is now going through all the paces that a normal startup would go through and uh we've been selected to participate in this one day event and to me it's it signals um that now nowadays as you said before it's not enough to to have the money on the table for vcs they want to be seen as cultivating the founders cultivating the community and bringing the added value of course they can't invest into everybody that come through you know one day accelerator or any other events that they host but at the same time they will you know forever stay in the memories of these founders as uh, the guys who are doing more than an average uh, guy out there so this uh, this added value is 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 very very important and um it goes a long way with if, I, if I might I may add on the, what Juliana said, actually listening to you, I was thinking that there's part of a differentiation that we didn't talk about because maybe we also can't, but I definitely see, especially in the Estonian market where Startup Wild Guys is from, that there's a lot of differentiation also in terms of who are the partners of the fund or who are the kind of the investors. And I think if you happen to nail and have a unicorn founder or have a superstar investor, mm -hmm. that's the whole differentiation you need. You know, sometimes we, we think about fancy pants uh, website and, and, you know, and then, and, and, and brand but i think uh, uh this is might sound very controversial but i think usually the ones you know who dresses the best the one the wannabes not the real real guys and i think it's the same sometimes when you see two two pumped up branding you're actually wondering what's behind it because as i said if you have the superstar on your team that's all you need that's actually like gives me like uh, a segue into like the next question that i want to talk about is you know like when uh, obviously, uh, you know, founders, when they submit the pitch decks, you know, you can like go through the pitch deck and um, and understand, uh, you know, what does the business do and evaluate, you know, it's an extra opportunity to go further. But a lot of the founders obviously use LinkedIn as a as an outreach tool. So so many of the times, um, you know, so how much, you know, when it comes to like marketing background, um, when the companies pitch, um, to to the VC funds, what's the background check that um, that everybody does on the founders before even talking to them? Like uh, this is like nobody talks about that, you know, to, to that extent that okay, here's the ten slides or fifteen slides that you need to have in your pitch deck. But you know, before you even like get to the pitch deck phase, you know, what's the the background that um, that any of you guys uh, do? And uh, I don't know, maybe like like Angelo, like like start with you, like. Uh, yeah, so how do you like look at that? You know, before before even like reading a, like a pitch deck. Well, first thing first is of course the pitch deck. Yeah, if you don't read that, you don't even know who the funders are exactly sometimes because um, if you have uh, like a process organized like uh, enough well, I would say 
Now you won't get in touch with the information without even know who's the person who's uh, provided those, right? So you dig into the pitch deck, you go to the funding team, and of course, LinkedIn is an amazing tool <laughs> to get to know what the funders did before and do a little bit of background check. Then you go for um, uh, news that are publicly available. If you use some uh, of the many platforms available for investors to scout companies and check information about the companies, you also go through that. But what I specifically do and what I push my team to do uh, is to uh, try to find three reasons why you shouldn't invest in that company. And look at those three things and uh, dig down, grill the founders on those three things that you have identified as uh, showstoppers. Because you want to be in the position where you need to find a reason um, why to not invest rather than why to invest. Sure. Sounds good. Uh, I, thank love you. I love it. I just learned something uh, today as well. Thanks as well for sharing, uh, sharing your approach. And it's actually pretty cool. I was listening to you and thinking that I would say that accelerator fund because of the volumes is a little bit different uh, animal. Uh, so I would say that in the, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, our scouting team works with like I think more than thousand uh, applications throughout the year, so the volumes are crazy, right? And I still believe that you probably sort of kind of uh, scrape a lot of uh, information still, but uh, for us it means that uh, these startups have actually filled our survey form. So first of all, Anton, you were asking about kind of LinkedIn LinkedIn uh, messages. No, do not send me messages that you want my money from startup wise guys. Not only because I don't work there anymore as of 2024, but actually in our case we have a very thorough and very clear application process, and we need to streamline it because otherwise we can't uh, we can't do it um, we can't do it and uh, basically in an initial phase uh, marketing is not checked uh, so uh, I would say that 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 comes into picture a bit later uh, when the first you know kind of non-relevant candidates have been uh, already funneled uh, but when the due diligence process starts, and in our case, it can be a really, really long process, um, uh, I would say that then we also do a very similar kind of check of what's available. I would say from marketing perspective, uh, well, do, do the hygiene. You know, you have to have a website, <laughs> ideally, but also we invest super early. Sometimes the startups don't have a product, right? So they don't really have a website. Uh, Think about also as a founder, what do you post on LinkedIn or what kind of information is findable under your name? not only the company, but also you personally, it, it, especially in early stage, I would say it's the team that makes or breaks the success, not actually the product or idea. So it's extremely important what kind of people are doing things. Uh, and uh, just think of all of the, I would say like almost like a check boxes. For example, do you have a crunch base uh, profile? Are you on angel list? You know, are, are you correctly represented in these databases where actually investors search for information? Again, if you don't have a website yet, then think if you have maybe a LinkedIn handle, uh, think which social media makes sense to you for example i really dislike that facebook pages because i think it's actually it's a bad sign for me it would be one sign why not to invest if somebody has created a facebook page but then actually and yana probably you can comment more on more on that uh, that the marketing uh, channels uh, so i would say a, in a very early stage it's not that important uh, but you have to show that you are legit so that would be the base from my side i i think any any yeah. uh, founders on this call should take note uh, 100%. And it's interesting that you mentioned Crunchbase and Angel List as part of the hygiene list um, of platforms. Um, to, to add on, on infamous social media networks like uh, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, well, it's, it's, it's really down to the niche that you're operating in. If you are a B2C business, probably you should be on Facebook and Instagram, if you are B2B, there's nothing really for you to do there. And it's definitely not part of the hygiene uh, list. Um, whereas LinkedIn is, and LinkedIn is important. And it's perhaps the first point where um, Angela and um, his uh, VC uh, colleagues will start digging into you to identify this uh, three showstoppers and, uh, and see what else can come out of it. Uh, so yeah, that, that profile has to be squeaky clean, um, both for the founders and the company. And that goes also for the things that people are commenting and posting. And I, I know a lot of people see it as uh, areas that don't intersect, but they do. And if somebody's doing due diligence into you, they will read what you are posting, even if it's not posted on your company's page. So that's, that's important, but it's uh, probably more of a, 
in, it goes to, into the realm of um, reputation management. Um, and it's probably just important to say that it's never too early to, to watch your reputation and, and, and preserve it. Sure. And like one thing to, to add as an investor, you know, the, what, um, because we are an outbound driven organization. So, so we often don't rely on, you know, internal, you know, stuff to be sent to us, but we look at the databases exactly as you said, you know, look for what we want to, whom to we want to talk to. So obviously like, uh, if you don't have a website, it's, it's harder for us as a series A stage, uh, business to invest there's always a product there is there is revenue you know um you know and and you know hundreds of or dozens of clients at least like in, if it's a b2b software a vertical uh but one thing i think that um i found more and more early stage companies uh, only get to it is sort of like is a hygiene in terms of the clients and like g2 g2 crowd as an example actually you know gives you know if not like a legion channel but it gives you a sense that like you already know that there is like potential legion platforms for you to tap into and so if you're present there you know this like gives a very high boost to me to to like understand that okay you understand how the marketing channels will work for you and this is you know one of those channels where you will get uh basically mm -hmm. you know clients and, uh, and a lot of the growth stage investors this is how they actually find companies they look for companies and they scrape those companies you know who are like gd crowd like uh platforms and who are growing you know on a sort of like weekly or monthly basis so they can also understand if there is a growth momentum in terms of reviews that's how they understand that they should talk to you because there's more reviews you know happening about the business for them it's not just about the fact that you received funding from uh, you know early stage investors but there is actually like traction in the clients so so being being present there you know one thing that i i think that also noted especially like like early stage um like when there's multiple founders uh when there's only one founder it's easy like he's the ceo and founder but then there is multiple co-founders you know sometimes there is sort of no like you know might be even like no ceo listed on the website and that sort of tells to me that um it's not clear like who should i be dealing with right i mean there's i don't know managing partners or something for you know managing directors uh and that is like a bit confusing uh because you know that also gives to me that okay there is a delegation of authority but like like you as an investor want to deal with one person you will talk with founders you know in the founding team broadly but uh you really want that centerpiece of um you know uh of communication because he's the that, that person who you will be dealing the most and so um if you don't have like a ceo across your company that's like a warning sign that something is wrong here and then maybe it's not it's not an established business that i maybe not even want to talk to you know just because like okay like they haven't figured out who's the ceo um, Anton, if I may to add on this one, I sometimes give shit to startups when they have uh, the CEO already, when the startup is not a few days old, that they use email like hello at company name. And I think it kind of correlates a lot that you actually want to be legit kind of like, and you want to be personal. You actually don't want to have an info at email that you use if you're the CEO who's actually going after, let's say, at least 100k euros or Series A, of course, would be even bigger money, right? Indeed, indeed, that that's exactly like, uh, and like maybe in the early stage phase, you know, it's still like, you know, it's 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 you know, people are trying to you know have like co-founders or equal, but as the company starts to mature and you know that role changes from being a founder to a professional, basically manager, and a CEO is a professional manager. It's not a, a co-founder and a CEO. There is a two different titles, uh, and a CEO is the one who manages really the business and, um, and is the one who's expected to um, to interact with with an investor community. Um, um, so, like one one of the things that you know emerged over the last couple of years um, is that you know obviously there is more data you know, to collect. You know, the the industry by itself has has grown to you know a few thousand you know, venture capital funds. So that as, as funds want to also tailor themselves into some, you know, niche uh, and like position themselves as like a data driven like VCs and uh, Flashpoint is, you know, definitely wants to position itself as a data driven VC. And this is like the core and the DNA of the firm. Um, and I think it's even more relevant with a, with an, an AI movement that that is that is happening um, across the world. Um, so, what are you like um, as as marketing uh, professionals, and um, uh, what would you say is like sort of like the KPI uh, metrics um, to measure internally 
to uh, to understand that the marketing is moving uh, in, into the into the right um, and and delivers our why to to you as a business. Um, you know, cu curious to kind of understand like how uh, how does you know accelerator think about its like efficiency, whether they like you know got enough. I don't know whether that's you know leads or conversations or you know to to have an early warning system that something is is being done right um and uh um and that you know it's uh um it's it, it works in according with the plan like i said i can start uh, i will be very unpopular here and i'm sure I'll, uh, angelo will uh, challenge me and anton you will too because i would say personally also as a marketer i am not the data-driven kind i sometimes love that i'm a very gut-driven uh, person maybe it comes with being a female uh, maybe something else uh, i definitely maybe in that sense uh, at least personally uh, i'm not going with the time but i do love ai uh however if we look at the company itself of course we do measure things and here i have to say that i have actually an amazing colleague that stayed uh, replaced me at starter wise guys ismail if he's watching then hey isma and he is the one who uh, who uh, brought in uh, the love for data uh, and uh, of course we measure we mostly measure overall general traffic uh, count of applications and also the cost of acquisition uh, so kind of like basic things uh, but we also go a bit deeper and since we are more inbound uh, inbound uh, oriented in terms of our uh, sourcing of startups uh, we have this long questionnaire and we do actually ask them uh, kind of where have you come why do you think this is the right accelerator for you and actually it's very non-data driven it's actually a lot of manual work but these uh, answers to why do you think it's the accelerator investor for you gives us also a lot of qualitative input for example uh, that we see that our branding is working because i think data can give you very good input about sales and, and lead gen but when you look at reputation and generally kind of is your message getting across are you positioned the right way i personally have always found it harder to measure so we so that's the part where we actually go more into kind of qualitative but yeah overall kind of do we have enough of applications are they coming in into right volume how is the kind of like activity happening and how easy is it to convert uh, one additional thing we check uh, lately i think we started doing it in last years to whom do we compete uh, against in this in the founder's mind uh, for example we used to compete a lot with very local players we came as i mentioned we came from baltics from estonia the unicorn land and uh, we used to be compared with other regional players and lately we see a trend that startups choose us over tech stars they choose us over 500 startups or yc uh, or maybe some of the kind of uh, bigger uh, european players and to us that means that also we're doing something right so we're playing in a different league if i may say so so that's maybe kind and not exactly data driven uh but uh, that's something that we actually quite uh, carefully look at cool no it's like a combination of qualitative and quantitative in that sense um yeah hey, angelo curious curious as a as a you know ai focused fund uh um you know what what are you guys you know how do you track your internal performance whether you guys are like getting enough i don't know leads or you know or any other metric that uh you guys track internally um to, to understand that you're moving at the right pace or you need to accelerate? Mm -hmm. So I have a short answer and a long answer to this. I will go for the short because uh, I think you can identify at least like a uh, hundred thousand different metrics and, uh, and KPIs that you, you want to follow. But um, also you need to understand that you don't have enough time, enough budget to actually go after those and uh, action all the improvements that ideally you wanna you wanna do right so you need to find um the optimum in a way and um i think uh <clears throat> that personally we have identified three main factors that we usually focus the most one is quantity because uh we can say whatever we want but it's a quantity game yeah the bigger is the is the bucket at the beginning the higher is going to be the quality at the end because of the quantity then we focus on quality specifically and i will get back to this and then we focus on uh, what we could have done better or why actually we didn't get into something yeah for example you do an outbound on linkedin an outbound campaign on linkedin in a specific sector under a specific uh, pain point or problem whatever and uh, you have a response rate of 40 percent right and then uh, uh, you move along with the startup with the 10 percent of the startup out of that campaign yeah, this is something you want to look at and a specific always push the guys to and the ladies 
uh, to, to look at the, the ones who do not reply. No, because uh, those who do not reply are the ones I want to talk to. <laughs> because why they are not replying? <laughs> maybe they are so good, <laughs> they have a lot of investors already. Or maybe they have uh, such a good product that, uh, that they, there is a, such a great competitive edge, they are going stealth. Yeah. So I, I'm a fan of follow up <laughs> contacts. Yeah. Because uh, the ones not responding for me are usually the ones I want to push more. Um, then getting back to quality. Quality is super important, but difficult to measure. So you need to understand according to your process, how you're going to measure this uh, along different stages. So what we have, we have checkpoints among the different stages of evaluation. And we just like mark the number of startups that are passing certain stages. So if the higher is the number of startups getting to the latest stages, it means that the higher the quality was for the specific batch or period of time that we were analyzing. Cool, cool. Yeah, what's 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 the KPIs that you guys or your, your clients really want to, you know, track you against, you know, as a yeah. as a service provider? Oh well, firstly, I I have to say it's uh, quite uh, uh, interesting to hear what Angelo was saying about the fact that they also do the outreach. I I, I didn't know that VCs do the outreach as well. I always thought it's the founder's job to do the outreach, but. Uh, Hey, that, that's that's the one thing I learned today, at the very least. Um, when it comes to the marketing agency and the KPIs we are tracked against uh, by, by our clients, we, we have some very standard KPIs that apply, say, to outreach campaigns when we run those. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. It's things like open rates, um, click rates, and response rates. And we're normally targeting... Uh, about 30 percent you know open rate and about 10 um, percent response rate that these are the good metrics to to go by um, if we're talking about inbound campaigns uh, you want to measure certain points across the entire marketing funnel so from say visits to your landing page or the website through to uh, the button clicks um and conversions so conversion actions could be different it could be you know from downloading a highly valuable piece of content like white paper to um actually booking a call with a sales rep or this is what every client wants but this is not as easy to get to as many think so you usually have multiple steps in between from you know just browsing the website to downloading piece of content maybe going on to the webinar and only after that responding positively to an invitation to speak to the sales rep um what else i wanted to add here is um now with this framework with this you know um modus operandi that i have thanks to marketing uh the way i approach the uh, fundraising for my startup is very similar so before we'd done anything we started with the strategy what would be our strategy for the fundraising campaign and we came up with a certain um with a certain points we wanted to focus on and the kpis were kind of inbuilt into it it's also how many people respond to us how many people even connect with us or open our email uh, how many positive conversations we have versus no's and it's the same final approach, interestingly enough, but I think it's helpful for founders to think about fundraising uh, with the marketing hat on, thinking that that's just another funnel that I need to build and just another pipeline that I, I need to fill. Um, yeah, and like to reflect on like internally Flashpoint. Um, so one of the things that um, obviously we kind of like measure, you know, how many leads, you know, as an outbound organization, um, you know, we definitely focus our activity in terms of like the volume of, uh, of uh, conversations that the fund has because it basically you know the if you don't have a conversation you don't have a deal um uh, and uh you know one of the things that you know about the quality of those uh sort of conversations and you know we've internally designed like a metric uh, which is like a lead scoring you know mm -hmm. of a of like an sql um so we've you know and this is like a segue into one of those like ai tools like how does ai help you uh in your making yourself more data driven um you know what we've done internally basically transcribing calls and you know getting like four pieces of data uh, about the, like, every company that we talk to for us it's like revenue you know the growth of that revenue um it's about like retention because usually we we talk with companies that are 
you know, and like into like one, two, three, four million dollars of revenue. So they already have like some retention profile that you can measure. And then also like runway, you know, how, um, you know, how much time does the company really have, you know, to, to, to raise that capital. So uh, we call it sort of like the great score. And, you know, we normalize that score according to what we believe are, you know, more important metrics versus less important metrics. And we basically, after like each call can, can rank a company, uh, you know, without even like making like substantial due diligence, right? Um, so we can sort of like already understand our funnel with some like preliminary like um, SQL scores. And that, you know, gives us a way to, you know, where do we actually want to focus more or less, you know, and also standardizes our, you know, approach about like, why do we think something is more interesting? Um, but it's like one of, as a segue to AI, like interested to hear your, you know, thoughts as, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, you know, marketing tech has been is starting to get like replaced, you know, by, you know, whether that's like copy AI tools or Jasper or some other, you know, tools that are, you know, writing content and blogs. So, mm -hmm. but curious to see like what areas of, uh, uh, of workflow improvements you've seen that AI starts to, you know, affect across, uh, across your parts or, you know, something that you've came across, um, as a, as an enabler for either founders or fund managers. Um, so keen, keen to hear your opinion. I don't know, again, if you can start. I can start with this one, yeah, if you don't mind. And actually very interesting as well to hear how you guys use the AI. And just if you don't mind me double checking, does mean you are lead scoring the startups that you're talking to? Yeah, exactly. So basically we like transcribe the calls um, using like a tool that, you know, uh, there's a number of tools that are doing. And then, you know, we like wrote the script that, you know, uses basically open AI um, um, uh, API to extract like four key points out of every cell script. Um, and so that allows us to, you know, because it's very hard for like investment professionals to, you know, make sure that they're data compliant and like ask, like they talk with, you know, tens of uh, tens of companies um, on a weekly basis mm -hmm. and like data compliance is usually like a harder one to crack. Um, and this is the way we solved it. Like, you know, in That's sense, great. Yeah. before AI, it was like, you know, like man mandatory, like feeling the, feeling the HubSpot feels feel like, and, and now and I don't have, have to say it. Anything. it. Yeah. So like, just record the call and we will do the rest. Amazing. Just ask the, ask the questions like, you know, uh, and obviously like, you know, companies that are using Gong and other, you know, tools that are, you know, they're probably uh, more professional, but across the VC space, uh, where technology has been the laggard uh the laggard part of the um of the uh the solution um it's definitely been like a more manual approach to things now and like, thanks to ai we're uh you know i don't have to demand that like anymore and yeah flashpoint vc is definitely not a laggard in ai that's uh that's for sure that that's amazing actually that's very interesting to hear how you guys are using it um when it comes to the use of AI for, for marketing, um, well, there is really such a huge number of applications available from what you already mentioned, content generation through to um, analysis and uh, ad optimization. And it really just basically take your pick, whatever you want to optimize with AI in the marketing process, you can do it. Um, for our agency, due to the services that Gear Starter has been traditionally um, delivering, which all evolved around content generation. Content creation was the main part that we started optimizing. And uh, with the, you know, um, with the existence of uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT and Jasper and all these tools, it has become much, much easier. Just to give you one example, we used to spend 20 hours on blog creation before for a technical company. With uh, ChatGPT and the likes of it, 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 it only took us four hours. So that's a really good saving, time saving and then budget saving. But we realized that um, although there are a lot of great content tools out there, they still do not cater to all use cases. And namely, most specifically, the user case of a typical marketing agency that doesn't employ prompt engineers. So people don't know how to prompt engineer well enough they will spend enormous amount of time in prompt engineering and they have multiple different brands to cater for because they if as a marketing agency you manage 10 15 20 100 
companies under one belt. Um, and the problem is generic tools produce generic content. So uh, yes, you can use it as a co-pilot and yes, it will save you time on outline creation, even blog creation, but it will not produce human centric, relevant quality content for your 20 brands that you need to manage. If it manages for one, after lots of lots of customizations, very good, but uh, even that is not a given. Um, that's as a, as a follow up, just curious. Uh, obviously, OpenAI like is 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 evolving in that sort of domain. Have you guys been like given your focus on certain verticals? Have you seen that you know like if you upload the data into um, into basically verticalized bot and build your own like bot? Yeah. Does that like improve the quality of the output or you? Or you yeah, you're talking about um, uh, customized chat GPTs, yeah. uh, my GPT type feature. Um, yes and no. Um, uh, yeah, we create, we spinned up the uh, custom GPTs for every single client. Uh, uploaded all the uh, all the main information there, like examples of content and um, you know, God knows what else. Um, the funny thing, it does learn, but it takes enormous amount of time. It takes months and months for it to learn, and yet you still don't have full um type of uh, you don't have the um the input that is um you, that you can predict so basically at one point it can create um the the input the content in output uh, as if it was customized and on the other like the next time it can create something that is not customized mm. so there is no it's not repeatable yeah consistency is like there is so no consistency and that, that's what that's one of the reasons why like after using chat gpt for over a year using and trying jasper and uh, copy ai and about 20 odd tools that we tried some of them actually um, startup wise guys invested into. Um, we tried so many of them. Uh, we still thought that there is no use case um, of an agency and multi-brand company that is addressed well. And that's how we started building our own product. Uh, yeah, YAI, which is Understood. YAI Understood. to address this, this issues. And Angela, like about like given that Look AI Ventures is you know a lot focused on that, like is there any like portfolio companies that you guys have backed that are solving the the marketing, you know, uh, marketing AI landscape or like what's your stake on that? Um, when we started the conversation about this topic, I was thinking about being a little bit controversial. So I will answer your direct question first, Anton, and then uh, I'll open the controversy. Um, so we have invested in uh, mainly B2C, B2B startups. So uh, aside from one um, software that is doing uh, transcription and translations automatically from videos, which is called Subly from UK, uh, we don't have any other B2C product uh, specifically. So that is the, my direct answer to your, uh, to your question about the portfolio. Uh, on the other end, uh, the controversy I wanted to open is on the fact that, uh, yeah, I wanted to highlight what, in my opinion, are the two areas of uh, of the VC world where AI cannot help much. And I think is, uh, uh, first of all, making the final decision on which startup to invest. Um, unless you are not uh, using a spray and pray strategy, in that case, it wouldn't matter. Uh, but if you are kind of trying to cherry pick the winners, um, that AI is something that cannot help you with because it's 80% uh, about the people. So you need to have the perception of those people. You need to get like to know the founders and understand what are their features in a way, Yeah, using the feature a little bit improperly, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, and the other part is uh, funny enough, but it's portfolio management. Um, because try to uh, organize a bunch of unstructured data from a bunch of completely different people from many industries at different stages, level of maturities. Uh, the portfolio management part is something that is crazy to manage. And um, <clears throat> the bigger it is, the worse it is. And probably Zen, you will have a lot to tell about this. But I'm personally experienced with uh, people from the uh, US having VCs, some um, 
couple of partners, not mentioning names here, but uh, there were many experiments done on the fact that uh, a VC fund could work completely in an automatic fashion. Yeah, and they were investing in uh, 100, uh, 200 startups just compiling forms. So you as a startup, you will go to the form, to the to the form on the website, you will compile that, then an automatic tool will generate the result. In three days, you got the money wired. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, sounds like embedded finance style. But the <laughs> the problem there was that then when they had to manage the fund, the, the portfolio, they discovered it was crazy time expensive and it couldn't be done in an automatic fashion. So, yeah, that would be my take on that one. Thanks. I was waiting for Anton to challenge and say, we have almost done it, you know, with our approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I, if I jump next on this, then I would say that um, uh, on one hand, uh, Personal note, I hated ChatGPT when it appeared because all of my career I actually have been earning money because I could write really well because I come from PR uh, PR background. And I was like, this is so unfair. And now I think now it's actually great because I hate to write the very technical things myself. But yeah, started wise guys, I would say on the marketing side, yes, we of course are using also uh, also right now my team, <laughs> my team that stayed is using a lot, uh, a lot um, content generation. But I would agree, Yana, with you that I like, I think still there is, you can use it kind of to source things, but especially to kind of, um, to fine tune it to tone of voice and in our case, our brand tone of voice is very, very specific. Uh, it's still impossible. Like I, I can tell it's a chat GPT text from the adjectives that are used, especially if it's a non-native English speaker. I'm sorry, but I think 90% of LinkedIn content nowadays is like all AI, AI, AI generated has become extremely boring. But anyway, that uh, that comment aside, so yeah, so in marketing uh, efforts, I think we can definitely use it more, but uh, it's kind of mostly content related. Uh, we are not, at least to my knowledge, <laughs> we're not that uh, AI driven in the processes. And I think part of that, Angela, might be exactly what you say, but I would say that there's definitely uh, area of automation that could be done. But uh, yeah, for example, portfolio management, imagine, yeah, for 150 plus startups, not all of them are alive, alive but we have more than 77% survival success rate. So mm. still decent amount. Uh, we even invested in one of the tools that actually is doing portfolio management. Mm -hmm. And it's actually one thing that we're trying to do is to get the same kind of data, like Anton, what you're doing in this kind of first yeah. phase when you're when you're trying to make sure, make sense of the data for you, then we kind of do the same through, but it's not an AI tool. Uh, we do the same on portfolio management because otherwise we would kill ourselves. And trust me, the portfolio department is always overloaded. Sure. Uh, but actually uh, going back to startups themselves, uh, I would say that AI really is right now the no surprise, right? The hottest, even though, for example, for Startup Wise Guys, it's not a very specific area we invest, which probably is a difference with you, Angelo. Uh, but I noticed that even many startups that are doing other things are heavily pivoting towards AI and, and applicability is like all over the place. I was just working in pitch training, which is a side gig I do while I'm, while I'm figuring out who I am. Uh, I was uh, working with uh, Ukrainian startups. Uh, we, were, we have a very, uh, very cool, uh, special program. And growth Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, uh, which is a free of charge program supported by EBRD and Taiwan Business, and uh, and uh, we they are they're giving us means to support twelve growth stage startups. So it's also later stage than our startup wise is used to. And basically, any startup that came into pitch training started with something about AI. I think there was like two teams out of twelve that didn't have an AI element in their business. And I think also the kind of I would say that it's clearly the hot, <laughs> hot thing that everybody is chasing. We will see how how successful and how how kind of uh, how that's gonna unwind. But definitely, I would see very interesting pivots in terms of regular startup that is using the, the nowadays available technologies to entirely change, for example, how they interact with customer, how they, how they, what and the to, business. Is. And to go full circle, maybe on like um, you know, we started that the the. the environment has has changed and like obviously for a lot of like investors you know uh supporting their vc strategy you know like it's uh it's been like rained under question you know uh you know with valuations you know uh suffering during 2022 as the interest rates has gone up uh, so like how does um like how does like marketing in that sense um uh, when not like marketing to, uh, to to the companies, but to the, the to the LP side um, of um, of the organization, um, you know what what are the things that you know to 
um, uh, to touch upon, you know, w- when you're going uh, and approaching the not the startups but the the LPs. Um, be, we talked a little bit about, you know, like what's your unique value or proposition to to the ecosystem, and um, obviously there is like a need uh, if you exist. I mean, obviously that somebody uses your product, but you know, uh, besides that, uh, like what are the sort of critical aspects when it when it becomes marketing to the to the LPs? Um, like what would you say like either from like like pr side like marketing side um um to you know that has led like successful uh successful campaigns um in in your previous backgrounds i guess i can jump on this one first because at star wise as we have uh, hundreds of lps uh, so limited partners or investors that have invested in our funds fun fact i am one of those myself we actually had the opportunity as employees to also invest so i always say i also put my money <laughs> but uh, basically uh, we have done very different type of uh, fundraisings for example we have run two crowdfunding campaigns which created a large volume of very small tickets uh, but uh, kind of i would say it's a very messy <laughs> messy way to fundraise but we were actually rather successful in uh, italy in italian we even fundraised, I think, 1.2 million uh, in a crop mm-hmm. format. So it was pretty cool. And the other one was done in Estonia through a Thunder Beam platform. But that's not the one I wanted to touch upon because I don't think it really kind of, uh, it, it's an interesting use case, but I don't think it's a case study, but I don't think it answers the question. So when it comes to attracting investors that would invest in our funds, so if we talk about prospects, I would say that is definitely a long-term game. So it's uh, sometimes the, I would say the sales cycle could be years and there's a lot of, uh, in, at least in our case, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of value in personal connections and still kind of face to face, call to call, right? So a very individual uh, fundraising approach. But of course, if we look at, and again, I come with more of my branding and reputation and storytelling hat here, uh, every little helps, right? There's so many, like this, there's so many puzzle pieces that create this image in the pro- potential investors' eyes and mind. Of course, they need, at the end of the day, they need, they need the hard facts, right? Of course, they look at the survival rates, they look at the past, uh, past kind of, uh, uh, numbers, how successful the uh, the previous funds are, and obviously all of that matters. But we see more and more lately that there are different factors that also impact uh, some of the investors, and they, I don't know, silly. For example, one investor came simply because we posted an article in Estonia uh, about Startup Wise Guys, and, and literally next day he called our co-founder, Hefti, and he was like, hey, I read the article, I think it's time, <laughs> like, I want to invest. <laughs> yeah, and I see you're yeah, everything. You yeah, it really invest. worked for you in this case. Sometimes, but it's not always like that. For example, definitely being on Sifted, right? Uh, I, it's the holy grail, you know, I would say, in Europe, right? To some extent. So, of course, again, I come from a public relations uh, field, so I, I understand the power of this, and I'm absolutely sure you can do it without PR as well. But, for example, in reputation management, PR is a very, I would say, often works stronger and better than some kind of lead gen campaigns or anything, right? Mm-hmm. You're not going to go in a cold emailing often. Uh, you you always look for the warm intro. You will you will look for the kind of occasion why to reach out and follow up right talking about follow-ups <laughs> why would you reach out to the person that has been gone silent and and how do you kind of catch up yeah and like to add a, to add on your point like um we've been in the market for 12 years um so you know we run like three vc funds you know two venture debt funds one secondary fund um so you know as we've grown you know also like our product portfolio like fund portfolio of products to LPs also, you know, widened. I think one of the sort of lessons learned for us also, you know, that we've, you know, maintained course throughout the strategy is, is being very consistent in message, you know, as uh, you know, not everybody like buys the first time you, you, you pitch the message or even the second, that's a, indeed a multi-year relationship for them uh, often. And so, you know, but when you keep on repeating the same message, you know, why do you exist and what do you capture? you know, for like five, seven years straight to, to, to people, people, you know, like, although they might think that they are tired of hearing your message, you end up, you know, building the trust level and with performance. And, you know, that that's when you like start to yield the fruit out of that relationship. Uh, some relationships are extremely quickly and, you know, as well, um, you know, seeing like an article about something and that c- c- kind of gave them a push, you know, why, you know, they should do it, you know, and because you like led them to the push, they, they end up choosing you. Um, and it's sort of more emotional driven rather than, you know, very like objective driven in terms of, 
you know, because of the performance or, you know, because they like really like investment strategy or, or something, but like for those, for those rational buyers or rational LPs, I think, you know, building that consistency and trust, you know, across data, but consistently across message has definitely been the, the core, um, the core what, uh, uh, what pushed people over, uh, you know, if not like in fund one, fund two, then fund three. Mm. Um, yeah, but I would uh, say I would say this is very interesting what you're sharing because I, I think it's also really depends the profile of the LPs because, for example, we're we are the same age as a company, so there's also 12 years. And, for example, the profile, the same as ticket size has really changed. And, uh, for example, there was a one, I call them lifestyle investors, uh, but I know that's not the correct term, but it's just my term. Uh, for example, uh, we used to have er earlier in the days a lot of um, people who invested because they thought acceleration is fun, you know, kind of like that they just like the vibe. They like to be coming for COVID times. They like to come to our dinners or even parties just to dance, you know, feel feel like they're also in their early days of the entrepreneurship and so on. And they were they were willing to kind of buy a ticket to experience, if you like, which is a very, very specific, uh, a specific value proposition to an investor. Right. And of course, it's not the same nowadays uh, for us also because the ticket uh, ticket, if it used to be even 10K, like you could become an LP. I would I would actually like support that, you know, for high net worth individuals, like being a part of the ecosystem is a lot is a big value proposition. Yeah, right. And, um, and so even, even like really... even for like individual investors that are actually like investing, not like 10k, even like people who are investing, committing to the funds, like you know 500k, you know, because it's it's commitment based. So so for a lot of folks, that would mean like maybe like a hundred thousand dollars a year. And so if mm -hmm. their you know net worth allows, you know, for them, really sort of like a very expensive hobby. Um, yeah. they might not admit it, you know, but, it but it is a very like for a lot of people it is a very expensive hobby and so yeah. so um you know accelerators are like one group of uh basically you know fund managers that attract that uh, that clientele you know early stage fund managers because of the size you know like usually those funds are typically in the tens of millions of dollars not hundreds so they can also be like appealing to that group of uh, clientele as you get over like 100 200 million dollars it becomes a bit harder to rely on those groups, um, you know, also because then you need to have like hundreds of investors on a per fund basis. And then, you know, it, it's harder to uh, to keep live relationships with all of those people. That's, you know, when you switch to family offices and institutional, you know, they, they tend to typically buy for different reasons. But uh, but early fund managers really like, you know, the ones that tailor to, you know, high net worth folks, uh, they do like sell that as a, you know, one of the value props. Right? Yeah, but I'm almost waiting for Yana to, to say, say from the marketing point of view, know your customer, right? Know your client, know to whom are you selling. And actually marketing really depends on, in our case, for example, we have a lot of this very, for example, we organize every every year, COVID, COVID disturbed us, but uh, uh, we just, uh, this year, last year, 2023, we came back to on-site uh, portfolio and LP gathering. So we organize basically uh, like a, non-festival for our portfolio i think it's the biggest probably on-site gathering in the whole europe of, uh, of our fund uh we had more than 200 people i think this year in bilbao and uh and there's a lot of uh, lps to whom it has been the highlight of the year and as you said anton right the the, the moment the numbers are still comprehensible. You can build these very, very personal relationships. You can follow up. You can invite them to coffees, or you can invite them to nice dinners and gatherings. And we we have been asked a lot about our events, but of course there is one point: neither they care about it, nor you can manage it when the scale kind of goes, and also the ticket sizes change. Yeah, and yeah, Angela would would, would be happy to hear your perspective. You know, on like in terms of. Uh, in terms of what that has worked for you guys and uh <clears throat> you can all, think, also like i think all the critical points have been touched uh, anton and ladies like, um, but specifically for me um the important the important part of marketing is uh, definitely reach toward the right uh personas according to how many even uh, lps you want to have you want to have just a dozen or you want to have uh, hundreds because then also stakeholder management toward those individuals, it's a, another thing you need to take care of, right? So it depends on your strategy that your fund has, uh, but using the right channels and uh, and having uh, the right uh, persona segmentation so that you know exactly who are you looking for, it's very important. So the first point will be rich. And uh, the second point will be what I called 
confirmation or relevance uh, because you want to be present in the in the public space with the relevant information relevant content because this is going to be what those people that you reach out to will find to confirm their opinion about a potential choice of contacting you or even uh, if they find you enough reliable right so this is definitely something that is combined between marketing and PR, as uh, Zain was also saying. So, yeah, this will be my two cents All opinion. Right. Yeah, so from, from what we can see, marketing a company, a startup, or, you know, scale-up is not that different from marketing a VC. You still need to know your fundamentals, like Absolutely. who are you targeting, who is your persona, your ICP, what sort of reach do you want to go after? What sort of approach? What is your strategy for attracting these personas? And, you know, implement the strategy. So the channels might vary, obviously, and they, they, they will. But you can see that, yes, marketing plays a big role, but there is also a role for PR to play in terms of managing your image and making sure that, you know, your message is amplified by unbiased uh publications out there that lend you your credibility like sifted or you know financial times whatever it might be again depending on your persona who what is your persona reading you need to be there in terms of pr what channel your persona is using that you need to be there in terms of marketing yeah and maybe yeah. like to finish on the like our discussion we have, we have a question from from the audience um and it, it is indeed has been like a uh, an additional channel of sorts, I would say, like uh, with popularity of um, uh, of like YouTube shorts and you know podcasting. Um, so, what are your thoughts on um, like podcasting as a tool to to build that digital like relationship with the stakeholders? You know, like A sixteen Z has done. You know, like uh, Turpentine VC has you know built like a podcasting tool. Um, uh, so, curious on on your um you know your thoughts as um you know ob obviously like it's it's not easy to you know build you know content uh, plans and you know schedule those interviews but curious like how do you view like the the importance of like podcasting as a tool to to build a communication uh with your you know stakeholders whether that's you know investors you know startup ecosystem in general like other vc funds uh you know some some people have like 20 VC uh, like and, and Harry built like a whole company out of it. Uh, so so there's different strategies uh, obviously um, and there's been success cases but uh, so but keen to hear your opinion on this one. Sure, I can give you an opinion uh, that I personally have on podcasts and clients come to us all the time asking should we be on a podcast and two years ago that would be should we be on TikTok and you know it's just it's just changes and it's different fads that come and go um my normal answer to that is like, again look into your persona are they listening to podcasts if your persona is a 50 50 plus uh, year old white male um who is maybe not very technical maybe you know podcasts are not the best tools for you you're better off being in financial times back to our pr point if your persona is very tech savvy and hangs out on multiple channels and like likes audio content, then of course it's given. You should be doing a podcast, perhaps. But um, my personal opinion is that in the beginning or whenever your resources, your marketing resources are limited, you're probably much better off going as a guest onto multiple podcasts rather than committing to producing quality series of podcasts that will take away a number of uh, hours from your from from every month or week how you're doing it and quite a lot of financial resources i have a i have a friend of mine um who is doing a podcast as as a side gig he actually invested about 50 grand of his own money into a podcast program for just one year um it's it's a it's a hobby and it's a side hustle and it's not generating any money he has another business that does that. But to me, that is an exercise in building a personal brand, which is which is a fair exercise. But you need to decide what is in it for you. Do you have resources? Do you have time? And, and then take it from there. 
Sure. Yeah. Well, like, guys, if you have anything to share, happy to hear your thoughts on this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump next. Then uh, I, <laughs> Yana took my words so out of my mouth. I wanted to also emphasize uh, building your own podcast, podcast versus being uh, being featured on the on podcasts that already exist. And definitely, I would say that the latter has way higher uh, reach, way higher ROI, and uh, and also it's a lot easier, right? Uh, it doesn't cost you much to become a guest uh, guest on a podcast if you have something meaningful to say and there's so 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 many podcasts out there and uh and i mean uh, if you have a good spokesperson ideally the ceo uh in the company why not for example in our case that's the case so cristobal alonso has been like we were counting at some point like where has he he appeared uh and uh, of course the the, the also the the point uh, yana you were making about uh, is your is your audience you're targeting actually there does it make sense will they hear it uh is a is a very good question uh funny enough in uh, startup wise guys we have been a <laughs> marketing team we have had this yes podcast no podcast fight for i think last three years uh with a very ch changing attitude towards it we even tried and uh, tested to record a few a few sessions uh, last uh, last autumn we never we actually never aired them uh, we decided that the quality wasn't uh, wasn't uh, there the way we wanted but i think given that podcasts are such a red ocean right there's so much i think the we come back to the first question about differentiation and to me all the time when i was stalling my team i was saying okay but what will what will our podcast be special with because there's so many podcasts that are bringing various guests from startup or vc industry and talking about stuff there's so many techie techie podcasts where they talk about technology uh there is a uh, uh like raw stories and interviews and there, there's opinions so so what is it and i'm actually wondering if there is any niche that is on on field and for personally i am really fed up with long podcasts i do like them i listen to them mostly when i'm driving long distance or i'm or i'm going on a hike but i love love headspace for example because their radio uh, radio has like five or seven minutes long uh, episodes and that's amazing like you can put your morning coffee you listen to it and that's it i'm i'm actually really missing very short uh, format uh, podcasts be it just general podcasts or be be it in um, startup field but uh, thanks david uh, who asked the question i, I hope we answered <laughs> at least somewhat um yeah i mean i think with that like that concludes our our you know talk today um Wanted to thank everybody who was um, who tuned in um, and uh, our speakers Yana, Zanya, and Angelo for for also pitching in and you know spending the previous hour with us. Um, as you know, like we uh, you know we continue to to invest across a variety of products. You know, we also have you know startup wise guys and um, uh, Loopy Ventures who are also like investing, as well as Yana who is uh, helping you know startups and and fund managers also to. Uh, with their um, with their marketing uh, services, so feel free to reach out to us if you want to intro to anybody. Uh, but um, but again, thank you all for for joining and um, uh, hope to hear from you soon. Thank you all. Thank you, Anton, for organizing and lovely to meet.